Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, Mark Astongay again, and uh, welcome you to um, Chapter 1 of our series on um, population PKPD modeling and simulation. As always, um, Joe Hebert will be online uh, either uh, in the chat box or by, uh, by phone if you have any technical difficulties. So please uh, relay any uh, messages to him if you can't hear audio or if you have difficulty viewing the video as well. So welcome back. Uh, this week we're going to get into some more detail about modeling and simulation, and in particular some of the basic concepts that underlie the methods that we're going to apply to the population modeling case. But we're, uh, we're going to start off with uh, some basic concepts that are not necessarily um, population modeling um, specific, but they are necessary to understand the population modeling case. Part of those, uh, those polling questions that I shared with you are also related to this first lecture today, and we'll get back to those answers later in the class. So let me give you an overview of what I'd like to cover. We'll start off by an introduction of population PKPD modeling and simulation. And this is something that really just more of, of uh, for your information, uh, puts things into context and gives you some her historical perspective on the tools that we're using and the methods that we're, we're applying to population data. Um, then we'll talk about the basics of nonlinear regression. Uh, we'll go back to our uh, hypothetical drug development case where we'll look at a data set and we'll start then to frame out the uh, methods that we might use to analyze that sort of a data set. And the methods will include things like maximum likelihood. We'll talk about the different least squares objective functions and then diagnostics for regression models. After that, um, we'll probably get to this only in the next uh, lecture, but we'll talk about maximum likelihood methods for population repeated measures data. And that's where we get into the, the full hierarchical mixed effects models, the population uh, nonlinear mixed effects objective functions, and the diagnostics for population models. That's something we'll tackle uh, the next class. But through today's class, we want to we wanna cover uh, this introductory piece and then some of the basic concepts of nonlinear regression, uh, in particular the method of maximum likelihood. We'll end the class with an example uh, that uh, you'll be able to take home with you and, uh, and give a try uh, for the lab session on Friday. Let's just make sure we have an adjustment on the, on the uh, sound here. Bear with me for just a minute. Okay, I've got uh, my microphone output, output maxed out, so if there's any sound problems, uh, please let us know, but it sounds, I think this is the best we're going to get. I'll try to speak a little bit louder if, if the audio is not loud enough. Okay, back to uh, population PKPD. Well, what is population PK? Uh, I've pulled some bullet points here from the um, US FDA's guidance on population kinetics. And in that guidance, they define population kinetics as uh, a, a study design and a study design and analysis method that aims at the first two elements here, which is to determine the pharmacokinetic model structure for the population and to estimate the typical mean uh, and uh, variability around the PK or PD parameters. But there's more to it than that, although the guidance limits its definition to those first two bullets. Uh, of course, in population PK, we want to be able to estimate parameters for the individuals in the population, and, and this is important. Uh, for us to uh, relate individual exposure metrics to response or any other type of uh, um, 
measurement where we might want to make some inference or adapt based on uh, PK predictions. Also to identify the measurable sources of variability. So it's one thing to just quantify variability, uh, but it's certainly much more useful to quantify that variability and partition it between components of variability that might be predictable, uh, that is associated with something we can measure, uh, like organ function or body size or age, uh, versus um, characterizing variability completely as a random uh, effect, uh, which has no predictive ability. And then last of all, we want to study these um, pieces of the pharmacokinetic system in the intended patient population, and that's really where the value of population PK methods uh, comes, in, in that you can, you can take sparse sampling from uh, a pooled population and make inferences about uh, the mean response and individual specific responses overall. So further to that point, why do we do this? To, really, we do this to understand the factors leading to variability in PK and PD response so the drug may be used more appropriately, and that might be better use of the drug for um, future clinical trials. It might be for, for drug labeling might be in therapeutic drug monitoring uh, in the clinic. Uh, but the more we can understand the sources of variability, uh, the better position we'll be in when it comes to controlling that variability and using uh, known predictors to, to your advantage in the uh, clinical use or, or um, planning of clinical trials. So this is an efficient way, it's cost-effective way to screen a large number of diverse individuals from the target population. Um, and it does allow us to investigate more than one factor at a time. Uh, but of course, the precision and accuracy of the estimation effects for things like multiple drug interactions or food effects, disease states, demographic factors, all of these things are really going to be dependent upon the information content in the data and the design of the study. So just because you can estimate these effects doesn't mean that you're going to have a reliable effect, although with some um, careful planning up front and, and also careful evaluation of the model on the back end, uh, we can make some useful inferences about uh, these effects in a population modeling setting uh, while still maintaining that uh, analysis in, a, in the specific patient population uh, for which uh, treatment is intended. Next, next, I want to trans, uh, compare the um, population versus traditional approaches in PK analysis. And I think this is something that most of uh, this group is probably um, familiar with, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll review it here. Starting on the right-hand side with traditional PK studies. What I'm talking about here are the traditional, smaller, phase one type studies where PK profiles are obtained in each individual under an extensive sampling paradigm. Uh, it's a single small study. The population being studied is usually quite homogeneous. Uh, in fact, inclusion criteria are quite severe to uh, focus in on a particular um, uh, question, where the, the question at hand is usually a single question per study. Sometimes you might look at two uh, factors, but, but oftentimes you're just looking at a single uh, question per study. These um, studies are often conducted in healthy volunteers and so you're extrapolating results to the patient population. The data analysis method is a simple non-compartmental analysis based on areas and slopes, um, very um, minimal uh, assumption making in the data analysis here. It's, it's highly data driven. And oftentimes we view these results as the confirmatory findings, whether it's for bioequivalence uh, or a definitive uh, food effect analysis. Um, these traditional PK designs are, uh, are, are quite useful for that. Whereas in population PK uh, designs and analyses, we've got a different set of scenarios. Uh, most of the time we're, we're talking about sparse sampling, uh, although 
there's nothing to exclude uh, inclusion of pooled data sets where you might include extensively sampled traditional PK studies in addition to the sparsely sampled patient studies that might be uh, from later stage development programs. Usually it's a single uh, large study or pooled data set. Um, the population could be quite diverse, so you might have you might have healthy volunteers if you have included some of the more extensive sampled um, phase one studies. But you also might have uh, patients with different uh, varying degrees of, of a particular disease severity, um, differences in, in organ function, and, uh, and so it's a complex uh, population and you have to really um, plan to study multiple factors in order to understand the variability. But by doing so you end up with relevant results to the patient population. Um, you've got to pay a little cost for that and that's in, in the data analysis side. So the data analysis is not as straightforward as the traditional PK studies where you need to build an analysis model um, and carefully uh, develop, test the assumptions and, and qualify that model for whatever purpose you intend to use it. Uh, so th this piece is, is a, a much more extensive process than the, the traditional non-compartmental data analysis. And oftentimes these um, types of analyses are exploratory in nature, in nature um, may be hypothesis generating and sometimes can be um, supportive of drug labeling and even confirmatory claims if the analyses are, are pre-specified in some way. So that's, that's a basic uh, difference between population and traditional methods. And I think that uh, that's, that's pretty clear, although the lines are starting to blur here when it comes to the model-based approaches. Uh, as I mentioned, um, it's, it's quite common now to include data from extensively sampled studies along with the sparsely sampled uh, patient-type data. I mentioned that uh, we, we developed this model to explain variability, and that's really the goal here, to understand the factors leading to variability. And so how do we do that? We have to develop models that describe and quantify both the measurable and unexplained sources of variability. And you'll see that when we, when we um, develop the rationale for the, the random effects hierarchy in population PK models, uh, including both fixed and random effects in the model. Again, more definition to come on those terms, um, but I just wanted to give you a, a hint of that at this point. And we'll talk about population data analysis methods such as the standard two-stage method. Um, this is something that some of you may have used before. It's quite common with tools like WinNonLin, for example. Um, naive pooled or average data analysis. And then uh, nonlinear mixed effects modeling, which is really the the framework the most rigorous framework for specifying population models and as uh, I've indicated here parenthetically uh, there are various estimation methods and, and this is growing all the time and we'll talk about several of these through throughout the course uh, but this is really what we're heading towards is understanding what what a nonlinear mixed effects model is for a population data set so more on these later let's uh, move on to the next uh, topic and that's to give you some context for the history and the rationale of these types of methods in the field of uh, pharmacology. So these methods were initially applied in clinical pharmacology um, with the goal of developing a method to analyze sparse data that was routinely collected in the clinic under therapeutic um, drug monitoring activities. This is really where it all started. It wasn't a drug development exercise. It was in, in terms of routine clinical patient care. As you know, those of you who might be familiar with, with this sort of clinical data, um, for certain drugs with narrow therapeutic indices, uh, it's quite common to monitor plasma drug concentrations to make sure that dosing uh, is, is achieving um, exposures that are within some predefined range uh, to avoid going higher than some pre-specified uh, toxic range or to avoid dropping below some minimal effective level. 
and uh, drugs like uh, theophylline and phenytoin uh, were, were uh, classic examples of this and, and uh, were used uh, early on, phenobarbital as well, uh, were used early on to develop some of these methods. So that was the original, original rationale. Is there a method we can use to, to make sense of these, these sparse data in, in, a, in a very diverse population of patients? So the, the group, uh, clinical pharmacology and, and laboratory medicine groups out at um, University of California, San Francisco, started with this and, and developed a, a, a prototype analysis software in the late 70s, which became non-MEM, the first version of non-MEM, on an IBM mainframe in 1979. And non-MEM stands for nonlinear mixed effects model. We'll, we'll define what that is later. And then from there you see that there, there was uh, a lot of research uh, focused on different estimation methods. Shiner and Beal publishing some details of the non-MEM system. Then you had other um, investigators such as Mallet who was one of the first to um, study a non-parametric maximum likelihood method whereas non-MEM uh, at the time was a parametric method. Lindstrom and Bates developed methods um, called the NLME method, which, which ended up in software like S plus and R. And so th there was some, some early development on different ways of tackling this problem. They were all dealing with a nonlinear mixed effects model, uh, which had uh, hierarchical random effects, um, and you'll understand that later. But they, they were all focused on the same sort of question. They were just approaching it uh, from different um, estimation methods, different assumptions about how uh, the models should be constructed, uh, most importantly, with respect to the inter-individual random variability. There was another thing going on at the time, and that was a, a series of um, conferences between FDA, academia, and industry members on PKPD in drug development. So although the method was initially developed as a therapeutic drug monitoring analysis tool, um, now where there was some thought about, well, how can this be useful on the drug development side of things? And there was a series of those in the uh, 90s uh, where um, a more formal uh, re review of um, how the PKPD information can be integrated through modeling uh, to support drug development decisions. All the while, uh, other investigators were investigating different methods, such as smooth non-parametric method, Davidian and Gallant, um, the Vonish and Carter implementation, which was linear in the random effects. So that was all quite useful. In 1992, the NMM Users Net was established, and this was a, a web discussion group that's still active today that um, was designed for users of this software to be able to share questions and solutions and, and, and really help to, to uh, broaden the, the user base of these kinds of tools uh, and, and help to make it a little more accessible to, to new users. Um, in the early 90s, other methods, including Bayesian hierarchical approaches using Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, were also developed. And those um, were, were quite useful in um, in formally including prior knowledge as part of the estimation process. Uh, these methods are still used today. They're, they're computationally a bit more intensive than some of the uh, maximum likelihood approaches that we'll talk about for population models, but they can also deal with the same type of uh, population data and have some nice advantages in, in certain situations. From there, uh, there were um, increased there's an increased focus on developing of um, groups to, to, to study and to share their, their experiences in population PKPD, modeling and simulation, including a focus group at AAPS, the American Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists, focus groups in other uh, similar associations. Uh, and then you had you know, some reports coming from FDA uh, in, in the mid to late 90s about uh, the numbers of submissions that contained analyses and, and what their impact was. And then at the end of the 90s, you had an issue of the final guidance from the FDA on population PK and, and more workshops. Now, since then, um, 
there's been a, a, a really a boom of activities here, and so I haven't listed all of the things, but it includes guidance documents from the from the European Medical uh, Agency EMEA. Um, we've seen a number of pharmacometrics departments spring up in pharmaceutical companies. Uh, there's also a broad use of modeling and simulation in clinical therapeutics now, uh, and so um, really this has this has sort of snowballed. Uh, to the point where um, it's it's become uh, almost become part of the process of uh, of drug development and uh, and the analysis of clinical PKPD data. But I just thought it might be interesting for those of you who who are not familiar with this is to get some idea of the, of the history behind this and uh, and how this has evolved in our field. Now, of course, these methods weren't developed uh, originally in 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 clinical pharmacology. They were developed in in other fields like econometrics. Uh, and we actually are we're, we're just borrowing the the method and applying it to uh, to our our problems, which which is a pretty common theme in uh, in pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. But uh, but it takes uh, some creativity creativity there to identify the the technique and tools in a different discipline and and bridge it over to to a new discipline. And so currently there's uh, there's broad use of uh, uh, modeling and simulation. Uh, even in academic research where there are some groups who are doing applied modeling simulation uh, as part of clinical research programs. Methods research, uh, which are more focused on uh, simulation-based uh, studies to address the performance of different estimation methods under a variety of conditions. And even some groups now working, um, continuing to work on software development. Uh, on the clinical side, um, these tools and methods serve as the population priors for um, Bayesian individualization of drug therapy through through therapeutic drug monitoring uh, systems. Uh, and sometimes uh, they're not necessarily um, individualized in a, in a Bayesian manner, but they may be individualized based on some measurable, uh, predictable factor, such as a measure of uh, renal function or age or weight. And then, of course, in drug development, modeling simulation uh, has grown uh, quite a bit to, to impact both internal and regulatory decision-making. Again, I'll pause for a minute to remind you that if you have questions, please type them into the chat box. Um, I'm not monitoring the questions box. I'm monitoring the chat box. Uh, and you can also direct that question to me privately or to the entire audience. It's your preference, whatever you'd like to do. Okay, shifting gears here a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about software, but um, I want to focus more on concepts here and not so much uh, make this uh, any particular advertisement for, for a piece of software. Um, I've listed a, a few of the commonly used tools today, although I'm sure that this is not an inclusive list, and I don't mean to leave anybody out, uh, but these are some of the more commonly used tools. So for example, NonMem, which was developed by UCSF and is now uh, uh, distributed and licensed by Icon Development Solutions, that's probably one of the most um, widely used tools, um, It uh, and, and, and most probably because of the way that the prediction model component has been included in NIMM to allow us to specify the kinds of problems that we deal with. A more recent development is the Monolix package, and this is uh, uh, an interesting tool uh, developed uh, by a European consortium um, where some of the same methods that are available in NIMM, plus some new advances in the, in the um, estimation algorithms, have been implemented. This is built on MATLAB, which is a uh, uh, Commonly used bioengin or engineering uh, modeling and simulation tool, uh, but it w you can um, you can run it as a standalone with some of the predefined models as a as a runtime library in Windows, for example. Uh, but for more extensive models, uh, I believe you need to uh, be linked in with MATLAB. There is another uh, general nonlinear mixed effects modeling package called NLME. This is uh, an algorithm that's available in R and S+, not necessarily tied to population PKPD type models, but it does allow for nonlinear regression with the mixed effects modeling type hierarchy. 
Um, a more recent development uh, on the academic side is S-Adapt. Uh, this is based on the ADAPT software, which has been used extensively in PK and PD modeling uh, for, for many years, but at the individual level. Now S-Adapt allows the, the incorporation of population data and a variety of newer estimation methods um, that have now actually um, shown up in the in NIMEM 7, the, the most recent version of NIMEM and are also uh, similar to some of the newer methods of Monolix. Um, just uh, for uh, some perspective here, the S-Adapt software is, uh, is an adaptation um, that of the ADAPT tool that was um, developed by, by Bob Bauer, uh, who was also the, the lead um, software uh, engineer at uh, ICON now on, on the NonMem 7 project. So there's lots of similarities there in the newer methods in non -MEM with uh, with some of the methods available in S-Adapt. Phoenix NLME is is a um, uh, nonlinear mixed text modeling tool um, uh, issued by Farsight. Uh, WinBugs and OpenBugs these are open source software tools focused on Bayesian modeling. So this uses the full Bayesian with Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, Bug stands for Bayesian inference using Gibbs sampling. Uh, these are um, general purpose regression tools, uh, but again, they allow the formal inclusion of prior knowledge as part of the regression problem. Uh, and they also uh, present the results in terms of posterior probability distributions, which are particularly useful for supporting decision making through modeling and simulation. And um, there have been some PK front ends to these. A tool called PK Bugs was available in the earlier versions of WinBugs. Uh, but now that's been updated. In fact, the, uh, our group in Metrum Institute has been involved in developing a model library now called the Bugs Model Library, which allows uh, specification of, uh, of a variety of the types of models. Uh, for example, most of the things that you can do with non-MEM um, within the WinBugs framework. And then, of course, there's also SAS uh, that's always developing new algorithms, and there's there's an NL mixed proc that allows the specification of nonlinear mixed effects models. Um, I am not sure to what extent anyone has done work on extending the model structures to the type of PKPD systems models that we might use in our field. So I'm sure that I've missed a few here, and that's not intentional, um, but. Uh, these are what I, what I would view as the most commonly used tools in, in our discipline right now. Okay. Shifting gears now, we're going to talk a little bit about modeling and simulation in drug development. Really just setting the context for uh, why we want to spend all this effort in learning these technologies. Um, and give, giving you a, a little bit of an overview of, of how modeling is used in drug development. Again, this is all introductory material, more for your own information, but it puts puts the um, the rest of the course into context. So you could view drug development really as a model building exercise. You're starting off with uh, very little information about this new molecule, and, uh, and what you need to do is find those pieces of the model, the, those pieces of, of the drug development information landscape that you need to put together in order to, to pull this drug through uh, various phases of drug development, ultimately to, um, to submission and marketing. Well, one of the areas that's most important is really the quantitative support for decision making. In drug development, decisions are being made all the time based on an incomplete uh, knowledge of the facts. Uh, there, there's always bits and pieces that are missing, uh, but decisions have to be made uh, in order to move ahead in a timely fashion. And so uh, integrating the available bits of information, whether they come from a current development program with a new molecule or from uh, literature sources or, or competitive uh, intelligence about uh, other molecules that might have been published or presented, um, that type of integration quantitatively of, of information um, supports decision making in, in drug development. Of course, w there are goals such as parameter estimation, either for um, 
use in the model or for, for uh, inferences uh, and, and labeling support. But more importantly, it's a, it's a uh, an iterative sort of uh, support of decisions, transitioning from early stage to later stage development, selecting doses and and, and um, assessing the performance of later stage trial designs, adjusting doses in special populations, sometimes confirming drug interaction studies or maybe even um, generating hypotheses for for uh, interactions that may not have been studied in smaller controlled um, studies. And then finally, for, for support of confirmatory efficacy and safety findings, either through exposure response relationships or some other you know, pre-specified type analysis, maybe dose response uh, and so on. There's a variety of data sources uh, in, in uh, drug development, uh, everywhere from preclinical through um, phase one, um, Sometimes, uh, depending upon the field, uh, that preclinical to, to first in human bridging is quite important. Um, th this is uh, particularly true for biologics, where uh, understanding of, 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 of human exposures is important, and in particular, uh, particularly um, trying to establish that, that minimum uh, effective biologic uh, dose uh, under Mabel considerations. Um, but modeling can play a role in, in that case. Um, extensively sampled phase one studies can be useful given, given the PK and potentially biomarkers to help uh, predict and to explore trial designs for, for the next stages of development. And then once you get into patients, phase two and phase three, that's, that's where you really start to understand uh, the sources of variability in the response and also to uh, uh, put some context around the exposure response relationships for efficacy versus um, tolerability type uh, endpoints. Other sources include published data. Data I mentioned th this earlier where you, you might want to pull in information from, uh, from competitors, from the literature, from the therapeutic uh, area and, and integrate that with your, with your current data set uh, through a quantitative model. And then certainly post-marketing um, opportunities are there too. Here's a graphic that describes uh, in a simplistic way what we mean by pharmacometrics. Pharmacometrics is the science of interpreting and describing pharmacology in a quantitative fashion. Uh, so in other words through modeling and simulation and, and, and what we're focusing on oftentimes is are these really three basic relationships. One is the relationship between dose and concentration and that's the pharmacokinetic system and that could be concentration in plasma or concentration at some target site. And then further, the link between that concentration and some response variable, whether it's efficacy or toxicity related, uh, or even uh, directly a, um, a clinical uh, endpoint for of, of regulatory approval uh, stature, uh, it doesn't really matter what the response is. is the, what we're trying to do here is, is to develop quantitative models to, to describe this continuum. And you see that we've got this big blue arrow for disease progression. Uh, just reminding us that drugs don't work in a vacuum and that there's an underlying progression of disease that probably needs to be described quantitatively as well. Um, and there's also the interplay between the progression of that disease and the drug response. And oftentimes, you know, the quantitative characterization of drug response isn't possible without uh, quantitatively describing the disease progression as well. So why do we do this in drug development? Really to increase efficiency uh, m and really minimize the cost of missed opportunities. So focusing on lead candidates sooner, um, moving uh, candidates that might not be uh, optimal for a particular indication, moving them aside and, and, and taking up the next compound in a timely fashion. Decreasing time to market for promising therapeutics. Decreasing the probability of failed or useless studies. Uh, and that's that's done through um, through developing models and applying them through simulation to explore trial designs. Developing the right doses, getting the dose right, is very important to avoid the post-marketing labeling or dose changes. Uh, potentially maximizing efficacy while minimizing toxicity. That's really the goal. And quantitative methods can be quite helpful for that. 
Why is this useful in, in our current industry? Well, we want to maximize the value of prior information, all of the data, available data within the company and externally through the literature, previous trials, related compounds and analogs, uh, competitors. Uh, this is something that, uh, that can be integrated uh, readily through a quantitative approach. Uh, even if it's just the process of assembling the data and looking at the uh, differences and assumptions across these trials, uh, that, that forces a development team to, to at least uh, become familiar with, uh, with all of these sources of data. Then developing a model to describe these um, goes one step further and, and uh, mathematically integrates all those knowledge sources. Models are really useful because they allow us to um, quantitatively evaluate what's our current knowledge and and what's the lack of our current knowledge? Where, where are the uncertainties uh, in, in the current knowledge? Exploring competing strategies and, and downstream options are, are both possible possibilities through modeling and simulation. Exploring novel trial design strategies and testing sensitivity to key assumptions and uncertainties in our knowledge. Uh, there's always an assumption involved in any decision that's made in drug development a modeling framework allows you to explore that quantitatively to, to be uh, quite explicit about what that assumption is and what the potential outcome of that assumption would be. And again, integrating knowledge is an, another important key factor across development disciplines, between development teams and decision-making bodies, and uh, over time. Here's another cartoon to give us some idea of, um, of how this might work in a drug development environment. We've got a graphic here which uh, on the y-axis uh, represents the uh, information gained or the knowledge gained going from some low level to some high level of knowledge. Across the x-axis uh, really represents time. In this case it's not any particular date or time, it's just the timeline of uh, development of a particular new chemical entity. And then going back into the page, um, the z-axis represents the level of prior knowledge. Uh, where up front here we have little or no prior knowledge, where further back in the screen there's, there's greater prior knowledge to leverage. So you could see that uh, you know, in a drug development environment where a new indication and in probably an untreated um, therapeutic area, um, new chemical entity, you're going to be at the front edge of this curve where there's very low prior knowledge and really all of the knowledge building has to occur with this particular compound. And so it's going to start off with early, you know, non-clinical work ident identifying toxicity and, and maybe some basic PK and biomarkers. Uh, moving into to first in humans, establishing maximum tolerated doses and exposures, looking at biomarkers in humans, and then relationships between biomarkers and efficacy or tolerability, some dose response work as you get into phase 2A, 2B, uh, and then ultimately um, designing phase 3 um, studies for confirming efficacy and safety and, and uh, submitting uh, applications for uh, regulatory review and hopefully approval. Well, th that's the front edge here, but the uh, the fact is, is that that's pretty rare. Most of the time, there is some level of prior knowledge, and so we're we're further back on this on this surface plot uh, than you might think. Um, oftentimes, there's good therapeutic area knowledge of the disease progression. What's you know what's the time course of the progression? What's the variability around the placebo response? Uh, what are the uh, typical demographic factors in in this particular uh, patient population? and as well as um, what are some of the, the, the marketed competitors out there and how do they perform. So there's some prior knowledge that can be incorporated quantitatively by either modeling the disease progression or the disease effects on PK and PD uh, of, the, of the new compound. There are also opportunities to, to take some of that prior knowledge and use Bayesian adaptive designs uh, where some of the uncertainties are supported by an evolving trial design uh, which is aimed to to fill in information where it's missing uh, by adapting over a range of doses, maybe adapting over um, uh, 
different patient populations, uh, and so on. If not Bayesian adaptive, then uh, even uh, traditional uh, frequentist trial designs that explore a range of doses uh, are also quite useful here for uh, understanding the, the, the exposure response relationship with respect to efficacy and tolerability endpoints. And then again, uh, borrowing from prior information of, uh, of uh, other um, phase three trial outcomes, uh, competitor responses, marketed market expectations and, and, and building that into a simulation model to, to explore the probability of, of a new compound attaining those um, attributes as well as using some of that information to help inform uh, your own designs for uh, the, the new molecule. And then sort of the end game here you've got population PKPD modeling and simulation for, for labeling support. And, and that's really the, the last step of the modeling and simulation and probably the least um, the least important from from a decision making point of view, uh, you know. Don't get me wrong. This is still a a, a very uh, useful way to summarize data for drug labeling and so on. But the high impact activities are really those that are that are applied earlier on in drug development, where uh, there are greater needs to integrate knowledge across a variety of sources, and where decisions are are really high impact decisions. That, uh, that, that could use that quantitative support. From the historical perspective of modeling and simulation in drug development, this late stage work was really the first stuff that was, that was ever done. Um, population PKPD in uh, late stage development, usually after phase three data had been collected, uh, was typically done to characterize the variability and sources of variability in PK parameters and, and, and used sometimes to support labeling statements about adjustments for special populations uh, and sometimes retrospectively to justify the doses that were selected uh, in phase 2b. Now, it's kind of difficult to do if, if your um, phase 3 uh, pop PK results don't agree with the dose selection strategy that was used earlier on and that's why I say that it's, it's, it's sometimes more uh, uh, efficient to move these modeling activities earlier in, in the development, but um, there still is a role for population PK work uh, at the end stages for, for uh, submission work and for labeling support. As many of you may be aware, there are, there are several um, there's broad support for modeling and simulation across regulatory agencies, both in the United States and um, in Europe and, and abroad. Um, looking at some of the examples of uh, guidance documents uh, from the ICH, uh, as well as the FDA and EMEA, there are several um, documents that, that identify modeling simulation as a useful way to approach, uh, to approach the um, challenges and questions faced in drug development. I was going to highlight uh, the um, end of phase 2A meeting here proposed by the FDA in, back in 2003 which, which was a pilot program now I, I believe is, is uh, it's going to become uh, or if it has not already um, a, uh, a regular uh, meeting that's available to sponsors um, but the, the idea at this at this time was at the end of phase 2A, uh, at, at the time of planning for dose selection uh, and, um, and trial design optimization, uh, this was a, an interactive meeting proposed between the sponsors and FDA clinical pharmacology and pharmacometrics reviewers to, um, to really make sure that, uh, th that the design and outcome of phase 2B and phase 3 studies uh, were improved. And this is part of the critical path initiative uh, to improve drug development pr um, pr prospects. But um, really, uh, at least from my experience, ha has been a positive uh, interaction for sponsors um, uh, interested in in making sure that uh, the phase two three programs uh, were focused on on the questions that needed to be addressed and that the available information was put to use through modeling and simulation to support those. And of course just to highlight that uh, 
you know, whether or not uh, your particular company wants to do modeling simulation, it's most, most likely that uh, regulatory agencies will take the data and use modeling and simulation to support their decisions and, and their review uh, processes. Um, and so, uh, again, there's, there's strong support on the regulatory side for these approaches, uh, mostly focused on the later stage activities, but, um, but still uh, quite relevant. Okay. So we're at a transition here now between uh, some of the, the rationale, the introductory material uh, on, on the, um, the method in general to uh, a more specific um, section on uh, nonlinear regression methodology. Um, so I'm going to pause just for a moment to give a chance for, for questions. I'll check the uh, the chat box. Okay, nothing yet. Uh, then we'll move on. Um, what I want to do here is is to go back to our phase one um, drug development example, and we'll use this. Keep this in the back of your mind as we're talking about the um, nonlinear regression modeling methods. Uh, but we'll also have an opportunity to apply this one hands-on. So if you recall, we're developing our, our new drug here, uh, MI-2005A, uh, and we've now conducted a single study, a multiple cohort in, 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 in the clinic. Um, it's a multiple cohort ascending single-dose study, first in humans type study. Um, in this study, plasma drug concentrations as well as various safety uh, endpoints have been measured. And one of the endpoints of interest is the effect of our new drug on cardiac repolarization, uh, more, more specifically the effect on QT interval prolongation. And so in this study here, we can imagine that there were serial ECGs collected and maybe even a time-matched baseline day um, for individuals on both active and, and their baseline. Uh, visits and uh, QT interval was measured and corrected for heart rate. So we've got QTC data, and the resulting base change from baseline values are, are available for analysis. And so here's a plot of the delta QTC. So this is the change from baseline QTC uh, versus plasma concentrations for our drug. And you see, you know, quite a range of concentrations here. A large clustering at lower lower concentrations, and this is this might be typical of of these types of uh, first in human studies, where you have a broad range of doses being studied, uh, and you see a broad range of exposure. So we might even want to view this plot on a uh, on a log log scale to expand the lower sections of the curve, but uh, you see that there's some population relationship here. It seems to be increasing uh, the signal of delta QTC as concentration increases. Okay, keep that in mind. We'll come back to that later. If we were to make sense of that data set and by developing a concentration response model, um, there's a variety of ways of doing that. But they're all really tied to, to something we call the method of maximum likelihood. So let's uh, think about what that method involves. So if we're going to fit a model to a data set, as we just did, we start off by observing the data. Looking at the shape of the relationship, you might do that graphically. You might uh, create transformations of the data and plot those. Uh, you might even use some simple smoothing functions and some, and some uh, statistical analysis tool. But you start off with some observations. And then, given those observations, you need to specify a mathematical model. That model could be based on a theoretical understanding of the physiology and pharmacology involved. It could be just an empirical relationship that seems to describe the shape of the data. Uh, but whatever it is, you, you need to specify some sort of model structure. So given the data and some model structure, the next step then is to define the parameters of that model, those values which we're allowed to, to iterate or to change 
uh, as you fit the model to the data and to then define your best initial estimates for those parameters. The initial estimates are just a starting point however and what we want to do is find the optimal estimates at the end. So we go from initial estimates to final estimates um, and, and that's done through some sort of, of an optimization process where we want to obtain the best estimates of the parameter given the data and the model structure. And then under that model and the, under those conditions we want to evaluate the fit of the model to the data. So this is, uh, this is the modeling process in a nutshell. Uh, there's certainly uh, more complexity to this and probably a few other downstream activities that we could do with, to further qualify the model for use in simulation. But uh, this is basically what we're doing. Make an observation, specify some mathematical structure, find some initial estimates, optimize the parameter estimates, and then evaluate the fit. And we're going to do this over and over again, uh, this very simple process uh, with, every, with every modeling exercise that we tackle in this course. Before we go a little further, I want to review some terminology. When we speak about a dependent variable, we're talking about the observed data to be described by the model. So in a PKA system, that's the plasma drug concentration. The independent variables are those measured or observed quantities that are used in the model prediction. And they're usually the primary predictors of the response. So dose or time in a PKA system, for example. Um, Covariate factors are observed or measured quantities uh, that are used in the model prediction, uh, but they're used typically to explain how individuals differ from the typical structural behavior of the model. So it could be weight, it could be creatinine clearance, you know, measures of disease state, and so on. Uh, these are covariate factors. And then the parameters, of course, are the values to be estimated given the data and the proposed model. So in pharmacokinetics, it might be clearance and volume and distribution. Or you might have a parameter relating the effect of weight to clearance. There might be a, a coefficient on the covariate, which is an estimated parameter. Uh, but taken together, all of these things uh, are, are comprised as part of the model. Um, the parameters, the covariate factors, the independent variables, and some mathematical model structure that allow us to make a prediction of the dependent variable. So how do we get there? Let's use the method of maximum likelihood. So we'll imagine a very simple case first. We have observed data, Y, described with a single parameter model, theta. The probability of the data, P of Y, can be modeled as a function of that parameter. So P of Y can be modeled uh, dependent upon the model parameter theta. And so when we view it as a function of its parameters, the probability of the data is known as the likelihood of the data given the model parameters. And so this is a conditional probability statement here. We're saying the likelihood of y given theta. So the likelihood of y given theta, that's the, the likelihood of the data under a particular model and particular parameter estimate. Well, which parameter estimate do we use for theta? The value of theta which maximizes this likelihood or maximizes the probability of the data under that model parameter, that's known as the maximum likelihood estimate and sometimes denoted theta hat. And so that's really what we're after here. We're, we're, we're looking for any given model, we're looking for the value of the parameter or parameters that maximize the probability of the data under that particular model. Let's look at that graphically. On the y-axis here, we have the likelihood of the data given parameter theta under a simple model. In this case here, it might be just a model for the mean, so the model is just that parameter. You see that the likelihood changes here. It rises and falls as a function of the, of the value of theta. Theta really could take on a, vari a variety of values, but there's one value here which is centered at about 15 which seems to maximize the likelihood. And you see this nice monotonic or this nice uh, uh, mon monomodal or, or single peaked uh, likelihood curve which, which easily 
uh, can be used to define the maximum likelihood estimate of theta. So that's a pretty simple way to look at it, but uh, conceptually it makes a lot of sense. And of course, you know, there are some values of, of theta here that uh, that have very low uh, likelihood associated with them. So, so they're not very probable under this particular data set. Well, let's take that likelihood function and go a little further with it so we can derive something that's useful from uh, an estimation point of view. The likelihood function of theta is related to the probability. It's not necessarily equal to the probability because we could have a proportionality constant here. So the likelihood of the data given theta is equal to some proportionality constant C times the probability of Y given theta. Or in other words we could say that the likelihood is proportional to the probability. Well, we take advantage of that proportionality here um, in, in a couple of ways. The first is that uh, it's more practical uh, to work in the log scale. So the log likelihood uh, is just a, uh, the natural log of the likelihood. So we're just applying a function here, the natural log, to both sides of the equation. And we'll denote the natural log here with a small l. So the, the natural log of y given theta here, or the log likelihood, is equal to the log of the likelihood or the log of the proportionality constant plus the log of the probability. right? So the, remember we're taking a product here in a linear scale, converting it to log domain, so now that product becomes an addition. And so again we could say that the log likelihood is proportional to the log of the probability of y under the model given the parameter theta. And as we said before, the maximum likelihood estimate of theta is the value of theta that maximizes that likelihood function, or maximizes the log likelihood function. So, as you probably know from calculus, what's what's one method to find uh, the maximum likelihood effort, the maximum likelihood estimate of a parameter here? Well, one way we can look at that is we look for some place where the slope of that likelihood parameter surface is zero. And so if we go back to this plot, you see here that you know we have a slope that's near zero down down at uh, these very extreme values of theta, but it rises steadily. And it's really the inflection point here, the peak, where the slope is equal to zero. And that's one of the criteria used for defining the maximum likelihood uh, value of theta. So as, as you know, the derivative type method is often used uh, to determine inflection points in continuous functions. So the first derivative here of the uh, log likelihood function uh, at a point of zero uh, is, is, uh, is the, the maximum likelihood estimate of theta. So for some models a simple algebraic solution exists for this and you can calculate the maximum likelihood estimate of theta with just a formula. Uh, that's the case for linear regression. But usually the roots of that equation have to be determined numerically. They're not analytically tractable and so you've got to use some sort of uh, search algorithm uh, to, to numerically um, search for parameters, values of theta, that, uh, that meet this condition and, and uh, uh, can be derived as the maximum likelihood estimates. But of course, that estimate of, of theta, the maximum likelihood estimate, or the apparent maximum likelihood estimate, should always be evaluated for the possibility that it's not a true maximum likelihood estimate, that it's only a relative or local maximum. Okay, so that's a very simplistic view of the maximum likelihood approach. We're going to extend it now to derive the objective function, but are there any questions before moving forward? Great. So let's look at that simple case, linear regression. This is the simple case where the algebraic solution of the first derivative equation uh, is analytically tractable. So you could obtain the maximum likelihood estimate and st standard errors without a computer. It's just an algebraic calculation. 
Of course, linear regression is useful for linear relationships. But oftentimes we also apply linear regression to methods that are to I'm sorry, relationships that are transformed from a nonlinear relationship to a linear relationship. So a transformation of nonlinear data to a linear relationship uh, now allows you to apply a linear regression calculation. But that should be viewed with caution in that that transformation can induce improper weighting in that uh, linear regression. We haven't talked about weighting yet, but this is something that's important if the variability is not constant across the range of uh, observations. So um, a word of caution there about applying linear regression to uh, nonlinear relationships. We'll look a little bit more at that here. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. So here we see a typical concentration time profile um, for an IV bolus injection of a drug. Uh, this is plasma concentration versus time. And on the left panel, you see things on a linear scale. On the right panel, it's a semi-log scale where the, the y-axis has been log transformed. So a couple things to observe here. First of all, the true uh, predicted concentration time profile is, is the pink line here, where the observed data are the blue uh, diamonds. And one thing you'll see on the left panel is uh, that the data, you know, the, the prediction line falls right through the center of the data. And the data are relatively randomly scattered around that prediction line. A few negative deviations, a few positive deviations, but it's, it's sort of scattered across the whole curve. One thing that seems to be clear is that the relationship here, the true relationship on the linear scale, is that the variability is about the same magnitude throughout the range here. So the spread of points at the high end and the spread of points at the low end and the middle range are all about the same. They're all within a similar band. That's called a, a constant variance, or in, in other words, a homoscedastic variance. On the right panel, we've applied a log transformation to the data. So we've got this nonlinear relationship, and we want to estimate the parameters using a linear regression. So we log transform the concentration data, plot it versus time, and now it looks like a straight line. Great. We can now use linear regression. But let's look a little more carefully. So the linear regression line does sort of pass through the data. However, you'll notice that the pattern of the variability has changed. So what used to be a constant variance across the range is now not so constant. Uh, it's pretty clear here that, that the variability around the high end is much smaller, it's tighter than the low end of the range. And so we've taken this constant variance um, regression problem and turned it into a non-constant variance or what we call a heteroscedastic variance problem where the variability is higher at the low end of the range and smaller at the high end of the range. Um, so that's one of the problems that I was suggesting there is when we apply a linear transformation to nonlinear data you, you might um, achieve that linear relationship that makes it easy to use linear regression but as part of that, you're not just changing the shape of the overall structure, you're also changing the pattern of the variability. And uh, if, if the variability is uh, appreciably large enough, this could affect the way that you estimate the parameters. You know, whereas if you had a nonlinear relationship and a nonlinear regression tool, you could analyze the data with the current variance structure intact uh, without changing it. So that's a concept that we'll that we'll hit again later in the course. So nonlinear regression is 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 what we're interested in now. As I said, there's no closed form solution of that first derivative equation, but it is a better way to deal with nonlinear data. We'll maximize a log likelihood function, and uh, actually mathematically, it's it's uh, more stable to minimize a function. So. What we end up doing oftentimes is minimizing a negative log likelihood, 
minimizing the negative is just like maximizing the positive function and 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 what we actually do is minimize a minus 2 log likelihood you'll see why we choose that later we use iterative numerical techniques to determine the maximum likelihood estimates of the model parameters um, and depending upon the methods used you might get standard errors of the parameter estimates as well uh, especially if, if there is so-called gradient methods and we'll talk about those in a few minutes so if we have a nonlinear relationship let's let's analyze it using nonlinear regression Okay, I'm going to just go back. I just uh, realized here that there might be a few questions in the um, in the question box. I uh, I didn't realize you folks did not have action, access to the chat box. So I'm going to go back and take a minute here before we talk about maximum likelihood estimation uh, and get into the, the real math of these objective functions and see if we can review a few questions. My apologies for missing that before. Let's see. Okay, a bunch of questions here. So I'm going to take a few minutes to answer some questions, then we'll move to the next topic. Uh, so other than the technical glitches of the volume, I hope that that's working better now. Um, there's a question here about uh, explaining sparse sampling across time, across populations. Yeah, what I'm talking about there with sparse sampling in population PK is sparse within an individual um, across the duration of the study for that individual. Um, so it's um, it, it, one way to think about sparse sampling. Uh, it, it, the data points are so few that you really can't identify the, the complete structure of the model for that one individual without borrowing data from other individuals. Okay, so the data aren't sufficient to support the model estimation for a single subject. Uh, and that's why we pool them across a population data set. Uh, another question: What are the FDA submissions? What are FDA submissions with PKPD analysis today? Um, I'm not really sure what that's getting at, but let me try to answer the question. Uh, FDA submission analyses include uh, usually a later stage analysis that it, that might include pooled data across phase two, sometimes some some healthy volunteer data, but usually phase two and phase three. Um, focused on really two objectives. One, justifying dose selection, and that's dose selection based on exposure response uh, for efficacy and toxicity, as well as um, characterization of variability in pharmacokinetics and recommendations for dose adjustments at extremes of the covariate or in special populations. And so those are the two major components of, uh, uh, of FDA submission type analyses uh, although there's plenty of activities in modeling simulation that are conducted earlier in development that never make it uh, to the FDA. Decisions about, you know, pulling lead compound forward from, from phase 1 to phase 2A. Uh, decisions about uh, the probability of a compound meeki meeting market expectations early in development. Um, so lots of times there are modeling activities that mev never make it to the FDA, um, but from submission type analyses, uh, the, the major goals there are, are describing variability in PK to support uh, labeling information, dose adjustments, and also justifying dose selection. Yeah, so another comment here about SAS um, PROC NL Mix. When I was talking about the different software methods, uh, I think this is a, a very accurate statement, is that as long as there's an analytic solution for the model we want to fit, we could use a SAS PROC NL mix to fit it. Uh, and I think that's also the case for, for NLME uh, or any of these general tools that don't require, um, that, that uh, don't necessarily have a differential equation solver built in. Um, the, um, the challenge, though, is that uh, if you have multiple dosing scenarios 
multiple individuals uh, with different dose schedules and sampling schedules now becomes much more of a of a coding problem even though the model might be analytically tractable um, the coding of the inputs and sampling times uh, becomes kind of cumbersome and that's where some of the more specialty uh, PK you know pharmacology based software can be quite useful okay yeah somebody's asking about reading material here and I'm gonna include uh, a reference list on the on the website uh, for this um, there are a couple of textbooks there's one called pharmacometrics uh, edited by Ette and Williams um, that's more of a reference for how how to do the modeling rather than a gentle introduction to the field uh, more more uh, useful te uh, references would include some some uh, literature publications and uh, I'm going to provide a list of those uh, it will be at the end of this document uh, once we get once we get there as well as uh, I'll provide a list on the um, on the course site Yeah, there's another comment here that we'll get to later in the course. Um, comment on modeling and simulation approaches, which are sometimes considered data dredging or, da or data driven versus hypothesis testing. Uh, you know, and so how does modeling follow the scientific uh, process then of developing a hypothesis, testing it, and, and uh, criticizing the hypothesis? Uh, we'll, we'll get to that theme later in the course, but just like any scientific process, modeling simulation uh, should follow the same. Uh, sort of the um, same sort of paradigm where, where you, where you make observations, you come up with hypotheses, you conduct experiments to test it, and then you either refute or accept that hypothesis, and then revise the model and, and move forward. Um, uh, oftentimes, if you don't have the right experimental design, this can be problematic. Uh, we'll address this when we talk about uh, model goodness of fit and model comparison. We'll also address this when we discuss how to build covariate models. Okay, I think I've got all of the um, questions answered now. I'm, I apologize for missing those earlier. I'm going to uh, keep the chat, the question box open, not the chat box. Keep the question box open here to um, uh, look for more for more uh, questions as they arrive. Okay, next topic: maximum likelihood estimates for normally distributed measures. Let's take our maximum likelihood problem that we just spoke about and we'll now expand it so it's a little more complicated now that y is a vector of data points y1, y2 through yn and that each individual data point is described by a normal distribution with a mean oh, sorry I didn't mean to highlight all of that a mean f of xj theta and a variance sigma squared Okay, so a normal distribution has two parameters to it, right? A mean and a variance. Well, the f of xj theta, that's just the model prediction. So the mean here is replaced by the model prediction. f is the functional form of the model. x is the independent variables. So in a PK model, it might be the dose, the time points. Uh, and then theta are the model parameters. So in PK, it might be clearance and volume and distribution. X of f, f of xj theta is the mean and sigma squared is the variance for that data point. All right, so if we can agree on that, next we're going to take this one step further and we'll subtract from both sides, we'll subtract the model prediction. So what happens when you take the observed data minus the prediction? You're left over with this error, epsilon j, so that's the deviation or the error in the model prediction at time point j. The deviation between the observed and the predicted. Well, that's that's equal here to the observed minus the, the model prediction. So now once we've taken the model prediction out of this normal, we, we, out of this normal distribution, we now are left with a normal distribution that's centered at a mean of zero and a variance of sigma squared. The mean of zero here just states that once we've accounted for the model prediction, everything that's left over is centered at zero but has some variance associated with it. So when we talk about maximum likelihood estimation for normally distributed measurements 
it doesn't mean that the dependent variable has to follow a normal distribution. Uh, oftentimes concentrations follow a, a skewed, a, a log normal distribution. What it really is referring to is that the error or the deviation between the observed and predicted is normally distributed. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. When we're talking about continuous measures, it's maximum likelihood for normally distributed uh, error in the, in the data. So if, if we have a normal distribution then, we can write out a probability density function for a normal distribution. If you look up in a statistics textbook, a probability and stats book, uh, sometimes you'll see um, definitions for probability density functions. And under the continuous density functions, you, you know, I'm sure every book will have the normal distribution. Well, the probability density of the data here is described by this equation. This equation, 2 pi sigma squared square root uh, times the exponential of the observed minus the predicted squared divided by minus 2 sigma squared. What I've done here is I've, I've, I've replaced uh, for the mean and the variance, I've replaced f of xj theta for the mean and I've replaced sigma squared for the variance. So if you look up this equation for a normal distribution, you'll see mean and variance uh, in the place where I've got f xj theta uh, and sigma squared. Okay, so this is just simply stating in mathematical form the probability density function for a normal distribution. Okay, that's handy then, because then we can derive the maximum likelihood objective function. The next page. So the top equation here is what we just described. This is the probability density for a single point under a normal distribution with mean equal to the model prediction f of xj theta and variance equal to sigma squared. Well, next we're going to take the likelihood of capital Y. The likelihood of capital Y is the likelihood of all the data points. Remember Y was a vector of multiple data points. So how do you how do you summarize the the probability or the likelihood across multiple events? You multiply them together, and so what we've got here is a product from point one to n across your entire data set of points of this expression, where in each case the observed data y j is going to differ depending upon which sampling point it is. So y at time zero, two, four, six, or whatever you've got. You'll also have a corresponding prediction at time 0, 2, 4, 6. And in this case, we're assuming that the variance is constant. This is now the likelihood function for the entire data set. OK, one more step now. We said that we could uh, use a proportionality constant to relate the likelihood to the probability. And that oftentimes, we want to minimize a likelihood function. We're going to choose a proportionality constant now of minus 2 log likelihood. Okay, so minus 2 log. If we apply minus 2 log to the equation above, let me put them both here together, you see that now, well, a couple of things. Number one, the product of the likelihoods becomes a sum across the log likelihoods, and that's just the, the law of logs. Um, we go from a product to a sum in the log domain. And then we multiply through by minus 2 log. Well. So you have the sum across all the data points of the log of 2 pi plus the sum across the log of sigma squared plus the sum across the observed minus the predicted for all data points squared and divided by the variance. Okay. Well, if we want to take this and now use this to estimate parameters, this is now going to be defining the probability or the minus 2 log likelihood of the data under the model given the, the independent variables x, the parameters theta, and the variance sigma squared <clears throat> by um, specifying this here we need to, to determine which parts of this function are going to be dependent upon the model parameters so this first term here the sum across log of 2 pi that's a constant there's no uh, there's no dependence there on independent variables on variance or on theta that's a constant so we can drop that from the expression 
And so what we end up with then is that the objective function for a maximum likelihood estimation problem, given the uh, independent variables, the model parameters, and the variance, is equal to the sum across all of the data points of the observed minus the predicted squared weighted by the variance plus the log of the variance. Okay, so this is something that might be familiar to you if you've done some uh, nonlinear regression with other tools, but this is known as the maximum likelihood objective function, uh, sometimes also known as the extended least squares objective function. Okay, so this is a very straightforward derivation of, of this objective function based on the um, assumption of normally distributed measurement noise. So to remind you the assumptions here, well, there's one assumption that there's an independence of residuals, that the observed minus predicted values are independent over time. There's no serial correlation of those uh, and that they're randomly scattered. And that's something that we'll investigate by um, looking at diagnostic plots for our model fits. The other assumption that we're making, I uh, just mentioned, is that we're, we're assuming normally distributed residuals with, re with a variance called sigma squared. And it turns out that if you want to estimate the maximum likelihood estimates, it's not quite so important that it's exactly normal as long as the measurement noise or the residual noise is symmetric around the, the mean. Um, but if you want to apply some of the statistical tests and um, statistical inferences that come with maximum likelihood, then that normally distributed assumption uh, has to hold. Okay, so we've got an objective function now. We've got an objective function now, and we want to... Um, use that objective function to optimize the estimates of a parameter of two parameters uh, given a data set and given a model structure. So we've gone through the basic process. We've made an observation of some relationship between data and some predictor. We've proposed a model structure and it's not specific here but let's just assume it's some model structure that involves two parameters. We've defined initial estimates for these parameters. So imagine that we define a value of parameter y of about 3 and parameter x of about 4. If you take those two and you intersect here and move up to the surface, the values of parameter x and parameter y will lead to a prediction which when figured into the objective function ends up somewhere around here. Probably a value of about I don't know, 35 or 40 units, no, maybe 30 or 35 units on the objective function scale. And it's right here on this surface. Now, of course, I've mapped out this surface assuming that we know all possible combinations of these parameters and that we could predict this ahead of time. This is just uh, for illustration purposes. <clears throat> when we're starting out on a real uh, modeling problem, we don't know what the surface looks like. What we're trying to do is to, is to get some knowledge about the surface, and in particular, parts of the surface that we are interested in. So we'll start out here um, with our initial estimates. Well, where do we want to end up? If this is a negative 2, if this is a negative 2 log likelihood objective function, we want to minimize that objective function to achieve our maximum likelihood estimates. So the place on this surface that is the minimum is down here someplace. This um, objective function surface would maximize the MLE estimates of X and Y at this point. How do we get from our initial estimates to here? Well, if we knew what the surface looked like, we could just pick the point, but we don't. We have to search for this surface. So what we do use are iterative search algorithms, and I'll review a few of them with you now. We'll talk about how, how they're used and, and, and what they give you. So one of the methods is called the method of steepest descent. This is an iterative method, meaning that it takes multiple iterations to achieve the minimum. And it's a gradient-based method, meaning gradient meaning that it, it relies on a derivative uh, of some sort to, uh, to achieve 
its search objectives. And it's useful when it's far away from the minimum. So the steepest descent method actually looks at the derivative or the estimated derivative of the um, model prediction with respect to the objective function. Or in this case here, the partial derivative of the impact of the model parameter on that prediction to the objective function. And so the derivative with respect to parameter y, for example, uh, of the objective function might be steepest along this path if we, if we uh, follow downward here. And what these methods do is they explore, given the initial estimates, they explore the regional surface and try to find uh, the points with the steepest slope, the steepest derivative uh, of the model parameter with respect to the objective function. Okay, so that's useful when you're far away and the derivatives are steep. You can make big steps and make some efficient gains down to the minimum. The Gauss-Newton method uh, is a little different in that it makes an approximation to the surface and solves for the minimum. So the, sort of a, a, a polynomial approximation of the surface given the local um, geography of that surface and tries to make an extrapolation to the minimum. Well, as you know, anytime you extrapolate, if you extrapolate too far away, it's not so useful. But if you're close to the minimum and your extrapolation distance is short, then it can be useful. And so um, it could be useful to apply Gauss-Newton as you get closer to the minimum. The Marquardt method is an iterative method that uses both uh, a gradient-based steep, steepest descent and then a Gauss-Newton method. So initially, where the, where the, the uh, distance to travel is further, the gradients are steeper, uh, the, the gradient method is used, and as you approach a more shallow gradient, the Gauss-Newton method is used uh, to uh, approximate the surface and to try to solve for the minimum. So we might start off with steepest descent up here and then convert to Gauss-Newton as we get closer to the minimum. Oops, sorry. And then finally I want to mention the simplex method the simplex method is, is not a, a derivative-based method. Uh, it's it's a, called a vertex method. Um, really, it's, a, it's sort of a local grid search um, where a few points are selected around the surface. And uh, it, you can imagine it uh, sort of like a, an amoeba crawling down the surface of this parameter search where it's sticking out these uh, appendages, pseudopods, I think they're called on an amoeba, but you know, You'd be looking at the local region and, and trying to feel your way around. What's the lowest point? What's the lowest point? You might wander around this surface for a while and then finally get to the, to the global minimum. It's not based on a derivative. It's really just based on the local um, geography of the, sur of the surface. All of these methods that involve a gradient or wh wherever there's a, a derivative calculated, um, you can easily derive uh, an estimate of the standard error of the parameter estimate or, or some measure of the precision of the estimate. So any of the gradient based methods allow you for allow you to estimate um, standard errors of the parameters. The simplex method doesn't directly allow you to estimate that but you could use the simplex method with another technique such as bootstrapping or jackknife methods to derive uh, a bootstrapped confidence interval or another another way of getting at that um, precision in the parameter estimates. Okay, so what happens if our parameter space looks like this? We start with the same set of initial estimates, y equals to 3 and x equal to 4, and we're up here. And then we apply, let's say we apply the steepest descent method, we quickly find a very steep gradient here, and we end up at a point where the gradient seems to plateau and we nicely have minimized or appear to have minimized the objective function. We, we satisfy the uh, criteria for a zero slope with respect to both x and y derivatives and um, looks like this is our, our minimum. Well, of course, knowing the truth here, we realize that this is not the global minimum. The global minimum is down here and this point is something we'd call a local minimum. This is one of our polling questions earlier. So let's see if you remember. Local minimums, minima can be problematic with gradient methods. Uh, there may be one or more places 
sorry for the shifting here. Let me settle in. Uh, it can be one or more places on this surface where the first derivative equation is equal to zero, and so, so oftentimes a second derivative is taken as as one measure of of, uh, of a test of that. But even that's not foolproof. What's uh, what's really important to do here is to rerun the search from different initial estimates. So if we had taken a different set of initials for x and y, maybe on, on this part of the surface, maybe still x equal to 3, but now y equal to minus 3, we'd be up here on the surface and might have gone to, to a different minimum altogether than what was observed uh, when we started at the first set of initial estimates. And you might do that three or four or five times, starting from different sets of initials, and uh, by looking across that group of, of runs, you'll find that you may have a cluster of them at a lower objective function value than maybe one or two runs that got stuck in a local minima. The local, um, the local minimum is problematic, and it's going to give you parameter estimates that are not optimal for this problem. And so you want to make sure that you, you've done something that makes your, your search robust to that. So the most important thing to do is to rerun your estimation model from different sets of initial estimates. The simplex method is a little less uh, susceptible to this because it's not based on uh, a steepest descent initially and sort of, again, crawls its way around. And so it might not find uh, this on the first shot, it might not find this local minimum on the first shot, but it still could land in a local minimum. And again, uh, starting from initial estimates uh, would be wise, even if you try a different estimation method. Another diagnostic for this is looking at goodness of fit diagnostic plots. Um, so it stands to reason here that if you use parameter x and y at this value to predict the data, that you're going to get a different looking prediction than if you used the parameters at this uh, maximum value here, or I'm sorry, the global minimum. Um, this would lead to probably a better prediction of the data than, than the parameters at the local minimum. So comparison of the diagnostic plots uh, for these runs is also important. Okay, one more topic to bring up here is heteroscedastic variance. And I mentioned this earlier when we were talking about the linear transformation of nonlinear data. Remember that I said that it's important that we understand what happens to the pattern of the variability in the data. Well, the residual variance sigma squared in the maximum likelihood objective function that we just derived was assumed to be constant. That doesn't necessarily have to be constant across all observations. In pharmacokinetics, sigma squared is often proportional to the observed concentration, in meaning that the variance increases as the analytical concentration increases. This is um, typical in uh, most analytical assays. It uh, has to do with Beer's law, where, where the noise to signal ratio increases as the signal increases. So we could deal with this in maximum likelihood estimation because both sigma squared itself and the functional relationship to the concentration, so whether it's, it's uh, just independent of concentration, if it's directly proportional to or, or proportional in some other way to the concentration, that can be part of the modeling problem. And so we can still estimate that using maximum likelihood approaches. Looks like we might have one or two more questions. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll address those here before we move on to the least squares objective functions. <clears throat> So one question is, when do you choose one algorithm over another? Are there specific criteria we should consider? And I think that uh, the most of the software developers have done this work for us. Uh, they've uh, built in quite intelligent um, algorithms, search algorithms. Uh, for example, in non-MEM, it does something that's similar to the um, to the Marquardt method where you start off steepest descent and use Gauss-Newton approximation as you get uh, shallower in the gradient. Uh, and uh, you know, s algorithm developers are always tweaking the way that these things work. So lots of times you have adaptive search methods depending upon what the gradients are and so on. Uh, we don't always have that fine control unless you're actually a software developer and, and, and writing the algorithm yourself. Um, 
but some tools allow you choices between these methods and it and it wouldn't hurt to try uh, a variety of choices when you're dealing with a highly um, a high dimension estimation problem like we do in population PK where we're not only estimating parameters for the population mean but also for the inter-individual and residual variances and even individual specific random effects uh, it's it's quite uh, easy to land in a local minimum and so if you have a, a tool that allows you different estimation methods or different search algorithms uh, you might just uh, try different algorithms and, and look at the performance in your particular problem uh, but certainly you'd want to try, um, even if you're stuck with one method only, uh, try running that model multiple times from different sets of initial estimates. Uh, do non-memory monolics use the same maximum likelihood search algorithm? Uh, I am not sure what's being used there, and I, and I believe that monolics probably has more flexibility there because of the nature that, of it being built on MATLAB where um, various optimization methods are available. Um, uh, the default method, I don't know what Monolix is using. In fact, I can look that up for the next class. Uh, but uh, it, in non-mem, there's only one method, and it's sort of a fine-tuned um, Marquardt method. Uh, in Monolix, uh, I believe that you could plug in different search, search methods there. But um, I'll double-check that for the next class. Don't know the answer. Okay, that's all the questions I see so far. Let's shift over to the last topic for today, which is uh, least squares objective functions. So we talked about maximum likelihood. Let's start at, start at the bottom of this page, where maximum likelihood was described as uh, an objective function where we're taking the sum across all data points of the observed minus the predicted squared weighted by the variance plus the log of the variance. Okay, you'll notice here that I have sigma squared sub j now. Sigma squared sub j is indicating that the variance might change at different time points. And this is getting towards that notion of heteroscedastic variance. It's possible for sigma squared to be non-constant. Okay, and, and so a maximum likelihood objective function uh, allows us to deal with that and sigma squared j could actually be you know a function of concentration or time or, or however you'd like to model it. So that does address the heteroscedastic variability. There are a couple of other objective functions that have been used very commonly in um, software tools for, for nonlinear regression um, that to lesser degrees uh, don't accommodate for the heteroscedastic variance. So let's let's go back uh, to the simplest of these and we'll look at how it differs. We call this ordinary least squares. The premise here is that if you minimize the squared difference between the observed and the predicted values by estimating the prediction parameters uh, across all data points is that you're, you're going to come up with the best estimates of the parameters. Well this premise makes a lot of sense you know if you if you minimize this distance this or the squared dif dis, excuse me the squared distance between observed and predicted that you're going to have a pretty good prediction um, but it makes a basic assumption here that all observed and predicted comparisons are equal meaning that the the noise in the in the observed data is the same a, across the entire range and so a point at the high end of the concentration range, uh, a point at the low end of the concentration range, they'll be treated equally in this, sort of, uh, in this sort of an objective function. So it may not be spelled out here in the software tools that you use this, but ordinary least squares assumes constant variance of the measurement noise. Well, some tools have recognized that and they've moved to something called weighted least squares, where now this ordinary least squares objective function has an additional term called the weighting which is some fixed known uh, pattern of the variability. Um, tools like win nonlin for example commonly use weighted least squares. Here you see that W might be 1 over the observed concentration. So 1 over observation. So in other words what you're taking is observed minus predicted squared divided by the observed value. Well, what does this do? It, 
it accounts for that proportional type of variability where if the measurement noise is proportional to the observed concentration uh, then uh, those points at the higher end of the relationship will have a larger denominator and their deviation will be down weighted in other words the, the, they'll be minimized uh, by by the weighting function uh, they will not have as much of an impact on the overall regression so that does get at the, the question of heteroscedastic variance, but one of the problems with weighted least squares is that it is a, is a fixed weighting. It's not estimated. It's assumed that you know it ahead of time, and it's usually fixed to some, uh, to some power here of the observed. So it might be 1 over observed. It might be 1 over observed squared, uh, and so on. Um, and you could try different, different uh, fixed values and, and look at the goodness of fit plots and compare um, but um, there is no way to, to estimate what that weighting should be. So that's where maximum likelihood really shines in that uh, the parameter sigma squared here is, is an estimated parameter in the model. We estimate the magnitude of this and we can even estimate the functional relationship between sigma squared and the model prediction. And so that's a real advantage of maximum likelihood. I've been mentioning diagnostic plots over and over again. I'm going to walk you through some of these. Um, the typical plots that we'd look at <clears throat> would be the predicted versus the observed, the residuals versus predicted, and remember residuals are the uh, observed minus predicted values, the weighted residuals versus predicted. So the weighted residuals are just simply uh, the residuals divided by some measure of the variability. So they're also known as standardized residuals. <coughs> Excuse me, and then also for for PK systems or any system that is dependent on time, we might look at the residuals, weighted residuals, and and observed and predicted values versus time, just to see if there's any uh, dependence over time that hasn't been captured in the model prediction. So here's an example. This is the predicted versus the observed. So we have predicted values plotted versus observed values. The solid line here would indicate a perfect prediction. This is a slope of 1. Uh, what we're looking for is that in a regression model, th there's a good balance above and below this line, uh, and that uh, there's no uh, obvious runs in one side or the other, so highly positive residuals or highly negative residuals. Um, w we'd like to see it balanced around this line. This also might give you some idea about the pattern of the variability in the data, uh, although this plot isn't too informative about that. Here's the residuals versus the prediction. And now you're taking the, the residual, which is observed minus predicted, plotted versus the predicted. Uh, and here we want to see the perfect prediction would be at zero. That's this solid reference line in the middle. Um, but you could have some points scattered above and below. Um, as you get higher in the range here, you might see a greater variability. There's not so many points in this data set to indicate that, but there is a trend towards a larger spread at the high end than at the low end. Uh, so you might conclude that, that the, the pattern of the variability in the data here is non-constant, uh, could be viewed as proportional. But this is a, um, a typical plot to assess not only goodness of fit, but the pattern of the variability in the data. That was one of the polling questions also today. Residuals versus time, again in PK, we might look at this pattern to make sure that there's no trend over time indicating either uh, that we've got the wrong structural model or that there's some time-dependent trend in the prediction. But it looks pretty good in this case here. It's, it's, it's well balanced with positive and negative values across the range of time. We look at weighted residuals versus prediction. Weighted residuals now are the residuals adjusted by whatever our weighting strategy is. So if it's a maximum likelihood measure where we have a proportional variance, then it's, uh, it's the residual divided by the proportional standard deviation. 
if it's a um, uh, a weighted least squares objective function, it would just be you know the the residual divided by uh, concentration or concentration squared, whatever weighting function you fixed in the in the estimation method. <clears throat> so this is diagnostic not only of goodness of fit, where we'd like to see the weighted residual centered at zero, but also about the strategy we've used to develop a weighting mechanism in our estimation model. So if we've used an appropriate strategy, what should happen is that the, the, the spread of weighted residuals is approximately the same across the whole range. So we might take something from a um, non-constant from a, excuse me, yeah, a non-constant variance or a heteroscedastic variability and convert it to a constant variance. And we want to be doing the estimation in terms of a constant variance so that uh, the, the weighted uh, difference it can be now included uh, on an equal playing field with the rest of the data points. Okay, so weighted residuals are different than residuals in that weighted residuals tell us about the goodness of fit and the performance of the model-based weighting strategy, whereas residuals tell us about goodness of fit and the pattern of variability in the data. It doesn't tell us anything about the pattern of the variability in the model that we've used. It's telling us about the data. Okay, so remember that. Residuals tells you about the pattern of variability in the data. Weighted residuals tells you about the performance of your weighting strategy in the estimation model. That's an important concept. Okay, and we can also view those versus time as well. Well, we're running a little short on time here, and I'm not going to have uh, time to get into this, so we'll save this for the lab session on Friday. But if you want to take a peek, uh, there's a um, spreadsheet available. Uh, it's actually a workbook available on the website for this week's lecture. It's called NLR Regression XLS, something like that. Um, and, and it, it looks something like this. This is a snapshot of, a, of a, an earlier version of this. But what it is is um, an implementation in a workbook of many of these um, least squares objective functions uh, where we've actually calculated out the objective function, the model prediction, and the observed values, and uh, we can use the the built-in solver utility in Excel um, to obtain the maximum likelihood estimates under these different objective functions. Um, so we're going to run. We don't have time to run through it right now. So you'll get off easy on the homework. We'll have to do it together uh, as a group, and maybe we'll have a chance to do a little bit more with this next week. But what I'd like you to do as a homework assignment is to just um, walk through this spreadsheet. I'll show you where it is. It's on the, the course site. You see right here, nlrworkbook.xls. That's, that's the spreadsheet I want you to take a look at. And look at each page where the objective function is specified. You'll see at the bottom here there's a tab. There's one that says OLS. There's one that says linear regression, OLS. There's a WLS. There's an ELS, and so on. I want you to look at each of those specifications of the objective function, and and then look into the details of how the calculation is done, so that you're familiar with these, and and, and uh, you know tell me if you agree with the way they're specified compared to how we just described those objective functions. What we're going to do is uh, is we're going to run through um, these examples, uh, trying to illustrate a few of the principles uh, that it takes when we're, when we're fitting a model to data um, under different assumptions for, for weighting. And you'll see here that this is an example of the observed data, uh, that it's, it's not a constant variance model. There's going to be increased variability at the high end, and, uh, and so we need to accommodate for that somehow. So your homework is to, is to play around with this, become familiar with the uh, specification of the objective function. Uh, be familiar with how the prediction is calculated, with how the uh, observed value, I'm sorry, with how the objective function is calculated for each one of those cases. And then we'll walk through it on Friday. Um, if we have time, um, I also have uh, provided you with a test data set, and that test data set 
is the QT exposure response data that's found here on the course site. It's called DQTC. Um, that CSV you'll see uh, it's a it's a comma separated text file. It has uh, columns for ID, dose, um, observed concentration, and observed QT. And um, you can use these for uh, we'll, we'll use these as a, as a test case once you get a, a chance to understand that spreadsheet. Uh, we can. Um, if you'd like, try it before Friday, but uh, I'll introduce it to you Friday, and maybe you can work on that um, before the next class. So uh, one last check of questions before we sign off for today. Is it true there's only one set of parameters that results in a global minimum? Well, ideally, there is only a single global minimum, but there may be, in, in some models, depending upon whether the model's over-parameterized, for the data uh, or even non-identifiable, it may not be true. There may be more than one set and that becomes problematic.